Here in Shropshire is a farm that's frozen in time, lost in Victorian rural England. A unique project has brought it back to life, as it would have been in the 1880s. This is the way to travel, isn't it? Ruth Goodman, Alex Langlands and Peter Ginn are living the lives of Victorian farmers for a full calendar year. From the cold of winter to the warmth of summer, turning the clock back to rediscover an age gone by. They're an unruly bunch. They really are. That's the first lamb you've actually delivered, is it, Alex? That is the first lamb I've ever delivered. They've been here for two months. Doing my back, this really is. Oh. They've sown a wheat crop using only horsepower, a back breaking job almost thwarted by the weather. Unfortunately, it's just not working out for us today. The problem is, is it's just so wet. Restored their farm cottage, complete with a coal fired cooking range. I've never used anything like this. You're one excited lady, I love it. I know, I am. And lost their new flock of Victorian sheep. What a nightmare. This doesn't bode well for the year. Oh, no. Now it's winter, and if the livestock is to survive, the team must winterproof the Victorian farm. It's November, and the farmers work to protect the livestock from the freezing winter temperatures. So Peter needs to build a pair of pigsties, the biggest challenge so far. We've had snow, we've had rain, and it's just so cold. Ruth will have some demanding household chores. And it's flipping hard work. And Alex must get to grips with their shire horse, the tractor of the Victorian farm. How am I doing then? You're doing very well. A Victorian farmer uses every available hour of sunlight, seven days a week. But if they want to enjoy a traditional Victorian Christmas, they'll need to get everything done on time. <laughs> the ewes have settled into life on the Victorian farm. But to rear lambs, they'll need a ram. Richard Spencer has spent his life breeding Shropshire sheep, and he's providing the services of his prize ram, Frederick. Frederick is a 20-month-old ram, that's called a shearling. And I'm rather pleased with him. I'm taking him up to the ewes now. He's not quite sure where he's going, so he's not very happy, but as soon as he smells the ewes, he'll be going like a bullet from a gun. I think he's seen them. Come on. If I get it wrong, it's trouble. There you boy, he's seen them. He's seen them. He's seen them. Come on, boy, look at that. He's been waiting 20 months for this moment. Look at the arrogance, look at the pride. Head up in the air, I am. And look at the back end, that's what a Shropshire is all about. Wool, yes, fine but meat, back end wide, plenty of width, plenty of meat on that leg of lamb for the Sunday roast. Definitely a lovely ram, that poise, balance, power, everything, everything where you want it, yeah, like that, good. Sue Farquhar is president of the Shropshire Sheep Breeders Association and has come to give the boys some advice on shepherding. When should we expect lambing time? Lambing time, if you put your ram in on Guy Fawkes Day, which is today, you would expect to have your first lambs on All Fools Day. April the 1st. Right, OK. One of the joys of spring. That's yes. it. You've got to learn to be good shepherds and watch and look, you know, and you'll get to know how your sheep behave when they're happy, when they're not happy. Get to know the characters. Yes and hopefully Frederick will fit in well. Ooh, this is Peter's shirt. I don't know what he does to his clothes, but every time they come off like this, look at it, ah! Ruth, an expert on domestic history, is tackling the laundry, a mammoth four-day routine. 
Victorian laundry is about only using the chemicals that you have to use, um, rather than just like throwing loads in the wash and using them willy-nilly. Instead, just use the little bit on the bit you need. The first stage of the process is to deal with stains. Oh, yes. I've got ink stains. Look at that. On my cuffs there. Uh... Some of the things that were being used in the Victorian period to get rid of stains were really, really ancient recipes. You can find reference to them hundreds of years back. Um, things like, um, well, the ink, for example. That's going to go in some milk. It just softens it all up, and then they come out in the ordinary wash. As I do it, that milk's changing into a sort of a grey colour as it's taking the ink straight out. After half an hour of sat in there, I'll just be able to throw it in the wash with everything else, and it should come out. Fruit stains, however, a bit more of a pain. Fruit acids are particularly difficult, and many Victorian recipes recommend that you first of all use butter on them, and then sit the whole thing in a mix of ammonia and washing soda. I've got some glue on here, I'm not quite sure how. So this one I'm going to get off with alcohol. This one is whiskey, <laughs> brandy, any of the spirits will work. Laundresses always did have a reputation with being drunkards. <laughs> Maybe it's using the spirits a little too freely. There we go. This is dry cleaning, really, isn't it? Dissolves straight away. Soap, after all, is just a different sort of solvent. It just dissolves grease. Um, whereas alcohol will dissolve a range of other things. That's just peeling right off now. Excellent! That's what I wanted to see. The chemicals have only gone where there is a problem. Use less, costs you less, pollutes less. Among the most important animals for a small Victorian farm are pigs. They'll eat almost anything and are the fastest growing of all domestic animals. But there's nowhere suitable to keep them on the farm they've inherited. So the team must build pig styes. A project like this on a Victorian farm, I imagine it would be all hands to the pump. Unfortunately, there's only uh, myself and Alex to a certain extent, so we've drafted in Tom here to give us a hand. Alex's brother, you might have noticed by the, the striking resemblance. With the foundations complete, the next job is laying the floor. Pigs must be kept warm over winter, so the team are insulating it using a Victorian technique. Are you happy? Yeah, I'll put a bit more down there. I think Tom's got a load of bottles to bring in. Oh, oh well, maybe one less now. <laughs> this layer of wine bottles are going to uh, create an air gap underneath the floor, and that will act as a form of insulation. A bit like in your house, where you'll have um, two walls with a gap of air in between. It will just stop the cold coming up from the ground, because pigs, they like their creature comforts. A bit like humans, really. I mean, humans are called long pigs. Obviously, we can't use Victorian bottles because, you know, there just aren't that many of them around and they do cost a little bit in antique shops. So we're just using wine bottles. The best way of recycling is reuse, and this is reuse. And uh, the crew have happily been drinking <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of <laughs> bottles of wine. They didn't need asking twice. <laughs> Peter covers the recycled bottles with a state-of-the-art Victorian material. Concrete. Pigs are very intelligent animals. They're also scavengers, and they're used to digging up things in the forest on the floors. If you've got stone, they'll quite often dig up the stones, whereas concrete is a lot harder to get up. Have you done this before? No. No, I haven't. <laughs> I've got, all, I've got all my fingers. Right, don't take your fingers off. Oh, I can see this being a back-breaking job. Of course, a farmyard of animals will need feeding. During the harsh winter months, this is a real challenge for the Victorian farmer. According to Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm, mangle wurzels are an excellent winter feed. These root vegetables are rich in nutrients and should last the winter without rotting. He writes about... You can use both parts of the plant here. Now, you can use the roots to feed the cows and the sheep. Yeah. The green on top, though, the leaves, you yeah. can use to feed to your animals, but he says it's actually better as a green manure. Frost destroys mangle wurzels, 
so Alex will need to find a way of storing them over the winter. The second week of November, and winter has arrived early on the Acton Scott estate. It snowed pretty heavily in the night, and it's settled, so the pigsties are off for today. Alex has gone out to um, feed the animals, make sure they're okay. But as for the rest of us, it's kind of a day indoors, really. Didn't think we'd get snow this early in the year, and it's, it's really going to set it back if we're having to you know, take days out like this. Ruth keeps warm in the laundry, where the clothes have been soaking overnight. All the advice manuals say that you need to get up extra early on wash day. So if you're normally getting up about sort of six, it's at least two hours before that. Um, I remember reading one of them that actually suggested that the laundry maid should get up at two in the morning on wash day. Two in the morning. Can you imagine? Most of the things I use stain removers from are from in this lot. The chemicals will have softened it all off, but they won't have actually removed it yet until I start doing the bashing. This is dollying. If you can see, it's a washing machine. This is what a washing machine is mimicking. Just swishing about so that it dislodges the dirt, which hopefully has all been softened by the soaking we did before. And it's flipping hard work. On a small farm like this, we're doing the laundry probably once a week. Um, the idea being that you should start on Monday and have it all finished and dry and ironed and put away by the weekend and then start all over again. I have to keep this up basically until the clothes are clean, until I've driven all the dirt out. If you think how long your washing machine is on its washing cycle, that will give you some idea of quite how long this is going to take me. After an hour of back-breaking work, the wash cycle is over. The clothes are ready to be wrung out. It might not look like it, but this is the most amazing labour-saving device. This is a real product of the Industrial Revolution, this machine. Mass production. Little domestic ones are new to the Victorian period. And as the cast iron manufacturers produce more and more of them, the price comes down and down and down. And more and more people can afford one. Ruth has now spent two days in the laundry, but she's barely halfway through the process. Alex consults the book of the farm for advice on how to store mangle wurzels over winter. It recommends something called a tump. I'm coming out to our tump or clamp, and this is where we've stored all our root vegetables for our animals for over winter. And we've just covered them with a layer, a thick layer of straw, some of the straw that we threshed. Now the reason we do this is essentially is to keep the frost off of them. It doesn't matter if they get wet, but if the frost gets to them, they'll rot down and they will last all winter round. Now that is actually bone dry. The organ grinder's monkey. Ah, the root slicer. Yeah, it's, it moves really well. Peter's taking time out from the pigsties to get these Victorian food processors up and running. This root slicer is about to be used for the first time in over 50 years. Mr. Ackner said it had a good action. Right. OK. However, it is missing one of these feeders. It might be a problems. problem. Might be. Let's give it a go. See what happens. So I just put, shall I put one small one in to start with? Because again, this is a machine that we haven't used before. No idea where it comes. Do you want a bucket underneath? Uh, that's a good idea. Good idea. <laughs> That's assuming, <laughs> assuming that it comes out the bottom. Right. Bucket in position. Up to speed. Ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant, mate. You just munched through it. It's like chips. I was going to say. Perfect chips. Oh, we need a deep fat fryer. 
<laughs> Look at that. That's the whole reason we're doing this, breaking it down into smaller parts so that the animal can eat them a lot quicker and also, of course, so that they can digest them that much easier. The more they digest, the fatter they get, and that's really better for us as farmers. To supplement these carbohydrates, it's important the animals have roughage, provided by chaff, cut up straw. OK, I think that's ready to go. Yeah, it's going. It's pulling itself in. This is a Victorian chaff cutter. The teeth drag the straw through spinning blades to chop it up. And it's going absolutely everywhere, Peter. Mechanised farming it may be, but the power comes from humans. You can see how people would have lost their fingers. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's so exposed, the machinery. You've got two blades whizzing in front of you. You've got two giant rollers with teeth pulling the, the straw through. It's a health and safety nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> this took a lot shorter than I thought it would. How did it feel, moving? Well, it's knackering. <laughs> Back in the late 19th century, machines like this, um, they really are top of the range. Yeah. And, it's, and it's innovation, it's, it's a new type of agriculture, that's the thing. The Industrial Revolution had brought an age of machinery that increased the efficiency of food production. As a result, farmers could now manage more animals and fatten them quicker, which all meant increased profits. ready for final, note the way I like the word, final, 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 final rinse. It's day three in the laundry for Ruth and another six in the morning start. This is a cube of blue. It couldn't be more finest, purest blue, could it? It's synthetic ultramarine. Ultramarine is a stone from Afghanistan, cost a flipping fortune. But in the mid part of the 19th century, chemists discovered a way of synthesizing it, making it artificially. Um, so this is artificial blue. And it'll dye the whole stuff a slight, slight tinge of blue, um, which will counteract the yellowness of the soap. And to the human eye, it will look white. They do look white, don't they? I see that yellow tinge disappearing. Modern washing powders still contain blue to give a brilliant whiteness. Next is a boil wash to kill any bacteria, followed by yet more mangling. This is when you need a small child, just a little pair of hands. That would be so helpful. Outside, the pigsty walls are slowly taking shape. The beauty of stone walling is that you don't have to build in courses. Paul Arrowsmith, a stonemason of 25 years' experience, is teaching Peter the secret of building with stone. But we're building the stone wall in the same, same way you build a dry stone wall, so all the stones touch, so it's stone on stone. The mortar just stops the wind from blowing through, keeps the weather out. But despite Paul's tutelage, Peter is finding it difficult. They have a habit of building like a row of rotten teeth, which is very hard to build off. So they find it hard to get the next course of stone on. Of course, unlike building with brick, no two stones are the same, and Peter is struggling to find suitable shapes to fit his uneven wall. At the moment, fish out of the water, really. 3D jigsaw puzzle, 2D jigsaw eyes on. So at the moment, I've, I've just got this gap I've got to fill. And I reckon, well, one stone would be nice. But, you know, <laughs> we're not in a perfect world, quite obviously. But I get very tempted to take stones <laughs> that are existing in the wall and move them. You want one for there? Yes, please. It's going to make me a stone. Oh yes, Master Mason, <laughs> at work. The stones are secured using Victorian lime mortar, and this is presenting its own problems. But this mortar, if it freezes, it's useless, it's like sand. Yes. And our pigs could push it over if they so wish. So hopefully, if we can build in the, the peak of the day when it's dry and a bit warmer, 
and then we cover everything up at night and water will dry. But it is the wrong time of year and people won't believe me if I, if I tell them I'm building pigsties in the winter. By half three, after just seven hours of work, it's time to stop building. It's getting dark already, so um, we're going to prep the walls for the night. We're just laying sheet fleeces over them, just to give them a bit of protection from the quite severe frosts that are coming in every night. It's the fourth day of the laundry process. The washing is dry. Time for Ruth to iron the clothes. I have to say, I hate ironing. It's so time consuming, this. Anybody makes any comments about me not looking anything less than utterly perfect at Christmas, it's gonna get hung, drawn and quartered. If the animals give you a sort of shape to the day and mean you have to, you know, have this daily routine in and out, it's the laundry that separates out your week. You know, Saturday night, sorting out all the clothes. Monday morning, the horrendous wash day. Tuesday drying, Wednesday starching, Thursday ironing. Oh yes, look at that, lovely. Every morning, Peter and Alex rise at dawn to feed the sheep. By now, if Fred the ram has done his job, all ten ewes should be pregnant. But at the moment, there's no way of being sure. The book of the farm recommends a technique known as rattling. This involves painting a red mark on the ram's breast. When mating with a ewe, it rubs off, leaving a telltale mark on her back. Let's put a bit of this linseed oil in. Here, I'm going to have to use some of this pig fat as well. Try and mix that in. Yeah, that's really coming together now. What do you think of this, Peter? How's that? Certainly red enough. To apply the rattle, they need to catch Fred. All 22 stones of him. Myself and Alex have spent a lot of time thinking about this. I mean, it's last time I handled sheep, I broke my finger. It's an experience I don't really want to repeat, although I think it's quite an occupational hazard. So the plan is get the sheep in the yard, split Fred our ram from them, get him in there, into here, close the gate on him, get him into this corner, and then shut this gate on him. So we crush him between these gates. Not hard, but just enough so he can't move. And then Alex can stick the rattle on him. That is the plan. That's what we're hoping for. He is really strong, this guy. He's an enormous beast. Thank you. <laughs> the round's quite big as well. Sheep. 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 There's the ram. The ram's over there, the ram's isn't it? The ram's there. He's right at the back there. Just slowly. Well, that was a little bit easier than I anticipated. Now the difficult bit, separating Fred the ram from the ewes. Our idea is just to push them into that end of the yard and then hopefully, hopefully gate them in, but um, it's going to be difficult. Right, we've got him separated now. This might take some time. No, no, no. On the Victorian farm, shepherding is men's work, whereas the poultry are looked after by women. These are our three turkeys. We have Wilfred and Ina and Lillian. Ina's on the menu for Christmas. <laughs> so I'm just keeping an eye on Yeah, yeah, you lot as well. We'll eat you too if you like. Turkey in the Victorian period was already taking over from goose as a more traditional bird. It's bigger for a start, so if you've got more people to feed, it's a better choice. And um, the turkey industry was developing over in Norfolk to a degree it hadn't really been before. And with the railways, many people in towns in particular were able to get turkeys much cheaper than they had been. 
it's always a bit sad to lose your air livestock because you get fond of them but I mean that's their purpose isn't it um, and I do find it very comforting to know that they've had a good life <laughs> Time for a coffee. <laughs> After a couple of failed attempts, the boys have finally managed to shepherd all the sheep into a pen. Now they need to separate Fred from the ewes. If you were to hold here and I were to go in, I could maybe turn one round. Yeah. And you could open, you could stand at the gate here. And let, we just let them out one at a time. Have... <laughs> Get the wrong one. Fortunately, he's right at the end. I know. Bloody strong. Come here, darling. There we go. Off you go. <laughs> they look wedged. <laughs> I don't know which one to start with. Yeah. Off you go. Right. Got him, I got him. Go strong, he's strong. Head in there. Woo! He is strong though, he's really strong. We really want to put it in a place so that when he does get on top of her, we can guarantee that he's mounted her very well and obviously that he's done the job. <laughs> Painting the fourth bridge with a toothbrush. It is, yeah. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Come on. Come on. With Fred raring to go, it's time to let nature take its course. Can you just give us a hand, Fonz? I just want to get this off him. Got his flock back. Is he going to jump on one? This weather? With the cold of winter beginning to bite, Peter urgently needs to finish the pigsties. It's another frosty morning on the farm. But early Christmas present from Alex is keeping me really warm, along with the fire. And um, the frost really is slowing up our building work because it affects the mortar so badly. But we're starting to get the roof on. So hopefully, by the 19th of December, when the pigs come, we'll be putting on our, our last bit of stain and saying, in you go, it's your porcine palace. Enjoy. Thomas Stackhouse Acton, owner of the farm's estate, is a Victorian farming enthusiast. He's insisted that every aspect of the styes be authentic, even down to the nails. Every time Mr Acton has taken down a building uh, on his land, he has saved the nails. Can we get a nice straight one, please, Peter? I'll try. These blacksmith cut nails were giving way to mass produced wire nails by the 1880s. These have gone up relatively fast, although I have to say, the way I've chosen to do it, kneeling on the battens like this, is absolutely killing my knees now. With work on the pigsties over for another day, Peter heads out of the fields to check on the ewes. We're in luck. It looks like um, the rattles worked. I mean, uh, a couple of the sheep have got marks on them, and we'll be able to split them from the rest of the flock, so we'll probably have two stages of lambing. All that trouble to get that onto Fred, and it's worked. It's worked a treat. It's December. All 10 ewes have rattle marks, so come April, they should produce lambs. Despite the harsh weather, the walls of the pigsties are almost complete. But there's still an awful lot to do before the pigs move in. The turkeys, on the other hand, are coming on nicely, ready for Christmas. But the farm's not complete without a working horse, the tractor of the Victorian farm. In the 1800s, over a million shire horses worked on farms across England, but today, they're an endangered breed, and just a few thousand survive. The team's been lent Clumper by Sharon Davis, a local farmer. Good Hello, Sharon. Hello. Right, how, are how are you? I'm well, and you? Wonderful, yes, good, I'm, good. I'm doing very well. This is Clumper. It is, yes. 
but Shara isn't sure whether he's a purebred Shire. Alex calls on John Ward of the Shire Horse Society for his verdict. I'll just have a look over him and see. He's got the size. The Shire's geldings are all 17 hands plus high for working. Got the weight. Right. He must weigh nearly a tonne. It needs a big horse to pull a big weight. So, so, right. you know, he, he's, and so the characteristic of the Shire horse is the, we, the feather. Right. The nice silky hair on the leg we call the feather. The colour, bay, grey and uh, uh, black are the colours. So he, he comes with that criteria. It, he's a, he, this is a bay? He's a good bay. He right. is, yes, yes. So we've got the feathering, the bay, yes, the, the, yes. The, the weight and the height yes, is, is yes, all good. Yes. And he's got a very good collar. Many people think a horse pulls a wagon. It doesn't, it pushes into the collar and then the wagon or whatever it is, is, is attached to the aims here. And so it actually pushes, it doesn't pull. So we're looking for a lot of strength in here then, Absolutely. are we? And of course, in there. Right. That's where the real strength comes from. Right. The power in the, in the hindquarters. So all, all, all round, this is a, a pretty good shire. It is, it's a good specimen of the breed. Oh, well, I'm for pleased. a working horse. That's great, that's great news. Yeah. The Shire horse was bred in the 1800s as the ultimate workhorse. Leading landowners from the Shires, Staffordshire, Derbyshire, Leicestershire, Shropshire, interbred the finest cart horses they could find to create the Shire horse. You're looking to breed a sort of, sort of super horse which is, is finely tuned for doing all of the kind of heavy draft work around the farm. That's right. All the work on the farm is done with, with, was done with the Shire horse. Right. But it's ploughing, harrowing or drilling or, or harvesting. It, it was their means of uh, moving anything from A to B. It was a shire horse that you right. did it. So this is, this is, not only is this your sort of tractor, this is also your Land Rover. This is your, basically your, your, your farm vehicle, is it? Absolutely. With Christmas three weeks away, Ruth begins preparations for the meal. Christmas puddings or plum puddings, a particularly British thing. You don't find them anywhere else in the world, really. Oh, brandy. Can't have too much brandy in a Christmas pud. Christmas pudding is packed with luxurious ingredients like dried fruit, spices and spirits, which would have been costly to the Victorian farmer. A time of year and a, and a dish which, in the Victorian pe period, people were willing to sort of save up for. We still eat Victorian Christmas pudding. One of those things we've hung on to as a tradition. One final ingredient to go in this Christmas pudding, and that's money. Traditionally, it's a pair of silver sixpences. Oh, that sounded an awful lot to me, so um, I've put in fourpences. Ruth's okay. rich mixture must be boiled without getting wet, and that requires some Victorian ingenuity. I like this bit. I've always thought it's a bit like magic. Take one good clean cloth, wet or damp anyhow, spread with flour. <laughs> and the instant I drop it into hot water, a seal is made, a completely watertight seal. In goes the pudding. Once boiled, Ruth will hang the pudding in the pantry until the Christmas feast. Hi, this is Sharon. Hi, pleased to meet you. Nice to meet you. To go forward, it's... Gee up! Gee up, lad! Sharon's been driving horses all her life, so before leaving Clumper with the boys, she gives them a driving lesson. And what about left to right, then? Left and right, we don't, I don't have any actual voice commands for that. Right. It's just a case of pulling the reins, whichever way you want to go, and just to give a bit of incentive. Right. Yeah, you find if you over, you, get a bit, you go a bit too fast. Right. If that's the case, you just pull gently on the reins and steady, steady. Yes. And do you, do you talk to him all the time? or? I tend to. I mean, people might think I'm mad, but it just lets the horse know you're still there. Um, yeah. It's just that little bit of contact, isn't yeah. it? Words of love. Oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of pressure to the reins. Whoa! 
Okay, ready for a go? Yes, yes. There we are. Right, okay. I said, you remember uh, to keep your hands nice and relaxed. Yep, and the overhand grip. You still want a little... He hasn't even started and he's uh, already backseat driving. Terrible. He's right. backseat drivers. <laughs> so I've got the right grip. That's it. And it's a... G up. <laughs> G up. Good boy. That's it. How am I doing then? You're doing very well. Yes. Very well indeed, yeah. yes. Brilliant. Working with horses is an essential skill for the Victorian farmer. So Alex and Peter need to get to grips with Clumper as quickly as possible. Christ knows what these sheep think. Mad. <laughs> At the cottage, Ruth has spent the last few evenings secretly sewing in her bedroom. I'm embroidering a pair of braces for Peter for Christmas. Only obviously I need to do it when he's not looking, so I've been doing it quietly upstairs. Um, in the evening, but that means doing it by oil lamp, which is is just so difficult. I mean, light is so critical. Those of us who are used to having electric lights at the touch of a button, we just forget how much daylight shapes what you can and can't do. So in the winter, when you're struggling and every job has to be fitted within the time scale, and you have to really prioritise, what can I do when I can see? It shapes your whole day and your whole work pattern. And it's not just the light that's the problem. I'm afraid I can't do much more than about an hour up here of a night. No matter how hard I try, I just, I just get so cold that I go so stiff and my fingers get so numb that I just can't carry on. Unlike Ruth's bedroom, it's important the pigsties are warm and draft-free for the comfort-loving pigs. Alex's brother Tom, who has worked as a 21st century tiler, is using a Victorian technique to seal the roof. Well, I haven't used this tiling technique before, which is bedding each one of these tiles on. As it's going on, you can see the benefits it's going to have for the, uh, for the pigs. See, these tiles are going to be kept onto each other as the cement goes off, restricting any draft or any movement of the tiles. Inside, Peter seals the tiles with cement using a technique known as torching. Torching essentially is like your modern day fiberglass loft lagging to insulate. All I'm doing is putting mortar on the insides between the battens and it, the mortar will curl in into the tile, meet up with the mortar Tom's already put between the tiles and uh, it will form a, a wind barrier, it will form a key to lock them on so the tiles won't come off, it will keep it insulated, warm, uh, draft free and it will keep the pigs very happy I think. At the cottage, Ruth is preparing a rather gruesome dish for the Christmas meal cow's tongue. He's been boiling for ages and ages and ages. Oh, you see, he's nice and soft. There he comes. What I've got to do now is skin him. Just get it to skin. As neat as I can. Often used to pad out other things on the table. There they are. Peels off nice. That's got the edges off. Makes a nice contrast to poultry. Stronger flavours on the table. Not that angle. Now the final touch to keep the tongue nice and upright, ready for the table. Oh, yes, that looks ridiculous, doesn't it? Come on. Come on, Iris. Come on, that's it. Ruth is keen to get the dairy up and running to make cheese and butter. But to do this, they need milk. So Alex has brought in two new additions to the farm. 
This one here, forget me not, she's in calf and she'll drop that in May. So we've just got to make sure all of that goes smoothly, drops the calf, it's fine, it's healthy, and we can bring that on. And of course, we'll have a milker then as well. So it's very really important that we have a cow, a milking cow, because obviously there's an inordinate amount of dairy that we'd like to do. The one thing it, it just takes is daily dedication, you know, coming in here two or three times a day, li at least. Cows are kept inside over winter, so must be fed twice a day by the team. Alex has prepared their feed in the machine room. What I've got in today's mix is some uh, sliced roots, but I've also got some... Uh, some of the milled oats as well. But the final ingredient would be some roughage. Because we've cleared out the hay loft and we've now got it stacked with hay, what I'll do is probably just drop some hay down from these chutes here. These shorthorn cows were popular with Victorian farmers as they mature and fatten quicker than the older longhorn breeds. Of course, this increased profits. For the period, these are sort of spot on. They really are sort of stalwart of the, um, the British livestock industry in the 19th century. We should check to see what Henry Stevens has got to say about it in uh, our Bible for the year, the Book of the Farm. According to the Book of the Farm, shorthorns were bred to perfection by the Colling brothers in the early 1800s. And here, Henry Stevens reveals the secret of their success. What he likes to put it down to is what we call inbreeding. Okay, so that's breeding um, related beasts that have that have distinctive, uh, desirable features. Okay, so that you sort of you uh, accentuate those features in in the offspring. By the time they'd finished developing the beast, we ended up with a cow which is both a good milker and very good for beef cattle as well. So, for us on the farm, it's really the ideal cow, it's what I'd like to call the sort of first real dual purpose cow. And it was an incredibly popular cow. It was the first cow to make over 100 pounds. But long before genetic engineering, Stevens questioned the safety of playing with nature. According to the manner in which it is directed, it's possessed of great power for good or evil. So that's quite interesting, uh, his comments there on, on inbreeding and obviously the dangers of inbreeding. Christmas is approaching, and Ina's being prepared for the festive lunch. You have a tough skin you have, Ina. And she's still nice and warm, which does make the job a lot easier than trying to pluck a cold bird. And she is in nice condition. The skin's really good. If you've reared a beast yourself, and um, then gone through all the processes of preparing it and turning it to the pot. You take time to taste things, um, to notice flavours and textures, and you just get more pleasure out of eating. I finished doing most of the plucking, but you always get up these last tiny little fluffy bits that are really hard to pull out, so the quickest way of doing it is just to singe it off with a flame. The farmers all do their bit for Christmas. So Alex heads out onto the estate in search of a tree. So it's a bit of the old and a bit of the new for us this Christmas. As far as the old's concerned, we're going to be getting in some holly and some ivy and some new traditional greenery with which to adorn the homestead. But for the new, we're getting in our Christmas tree. And this is a fad that really takes off in the Victorian period. In 1848, the Illustrated London News printed this picture of the royal family gathered around a Christmas tree, a tradition brought from Germany by Prince Albert. And of course, when the British public get to see this, of course everyone wants a Christmas tree. Here we go, not far off. There we go. At the cottage, Ina's stuffed and ready to be roasted, using state-of-the-art Victorian technology. I've got a marvellous new contraption to help me. It's a, I've called a bottle jack, and it's made of clockwork, and that's going to turn the meat for me. And then this screen around it is often called a hastener, because it reflects the heat back and speeds up the cooking. So it's a bottle jack and hastener. Like in a kebab shop, when you, you, know, you see that, that, that heated grill, and then there's the... the the kebab twists in front of it. That's how we always used to roast meat, in front of a sheet of flame. So here we go. I'm going to wind up the bottle jack.
And then if I started off by giving the meat a little twist just to get it going, and you should hear it click and then it'll turn back the other way. There we go. Now all I've got to do is move it round. And I should be able to come back to it not too often. Leave me space to do the rest of the cooking. It's been a couple of months. They've been cold, they've been wet, they've been snowy, sometimes been sunny, but we finally finished our pig styes. And I think they look absolutely fabulous. I'm actually genuinely really, really excited. Such a sense of achievement, really. But before the pigs can move in, the styes must be approved by the landlord of the Acton Scott estate, Thomas Acton. Good afternoon. Afternoon. They've built this pig style. At noon, on the dot, he arrives to inspect them. See how it measures up to the recommendations of Henry Stevens. He comes equipped with the Victorian farming bible, Henry Stevens' Book of the Farm. For a breeding style, each apartment should not be less than six feet square. <laughs> Lucky we made that one slightly bigger. <laughs> yeah, we, we measure them. We, we might want to measure them. What have we got there? Two. I'm feeling four, a bit nervous at the moment. Five feet. Six. And another foot there, seven. So the styes are big enough, but what about their living quarters? And the floor oh. consists of bottles in the floor. I think it could be very comfortable for the pig. So do you approve, Mr Acton? Well, I think it's, uh, it, it measures up to uh, what Henry Stevens suggests. Yeah. It looks very well built, extremely solid, and fits in well with the uh, other buildings around it. With the Acton seal of approval, the final job is to lay a stone carved with Thomas Stackhouse Acton's initials. 2007. <laughs> 106 years late, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's quite as heavy as it looks. What do you think of the stone, Mr Acton? I think it's slightly tilted. <laughs> <laughs> the pig stones or the stone? <laughs> The pigs have arrived, but show little interest in their splendid new home. Come on. One at a time might be a bit, three of them. Well, they're young, they're not teenagers. Like, yeah. <laughs> Peter may have mastered shepherding sheep, but pigs are a different matter. They're an unruly bunch. They really are. Come on, home time. In you go. You as well. These are our sort of teenager Tamworth pigs, and they're our first addition to these pigsties. They're really good for their bacon. They're the most yeah. attractive things, aren't they? I mean, as pigs go, are I think that they're the prettiest. You're saying that because they're ginger. Because <laughs> they're oh, Thank you. Yes, yes. Can't possibly be more gorgeous than ginger, can you? No. <laughs> It's Christmas Eve. Ruth is putting the finishing touches to the decorations before tomorrow's meal. Nowadays, many people put trees up weeks and weeks and weeks before Christmas, and you have this huge long run up. But the Victorians didn't. Christmas trees came in really much, very much at the last minute. Um, often Christmas Eve itself. Although the Christmas tree is new, um, bringing greens into the house was something that goes, well, it goes back so far, you can't even find the beginnings of it. Anything that was green and looking lively, you know, just to brighten the place up. As evening falls, Clumper transports the farmers to the Acton Scott Church for the Christmas carol service. It's a chance for Alex to show off his new driving skills. It's cold in my hands, this. I'm going to have to knit you I some granny imagine. gloves. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to borrow mine? No, I'm all, I'll be all right. Sure? I'll be all right until we get to the church. Okay. I mean, I imagine the church back in the late 19th century would have been 
brimming with people. I think Axon Scott had something around something of 150, 180 people used to live at yeah, Axon Scott. This and parish. now you're looking at a handful. Yeah. yeah. Good boy. Alex hasn't quite perfected that left turn yet. Whoa. In the 19th century, the Industrial Revolution brought great change to the British countryside. Many rural people feared that their way of life was being eroded. So Christmas saw a resurgence in popularity as they sought to maintain a sense of tradition. Customs, sometimes dating back to medieval times, were reinvented, and old carols revived, often with new melodies put to old words. Christmas. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's Christmas morning. Before the guests arrive, it's time to exchange presents. Who's a lucky boy? Oh. Yeah, that's superb. Where, where, oh no, I was just going to say, where are the lederhosen? <laughs> Until the 1850s, Christmas presents were usually just given to children. But with the creeping commercialism of the late 1800s, adults too began exchanging gifts, though often they were homemade. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm two years old again. Yeah, this looks suspiciously. Well, for me, it sums up Christmas. Looks suspiciously book -like. And I know you like I, it. I do like books. Oh, it is a book. It is. Oh, fantastic! Christmas Carol. Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, published in 1843, coincided with the inventions of the cracker, the Christmas card, and the popularity of the Christmas tree. It just sort of captures the mood of everything everybody was thinking about Christmas. It just sort of like hits the crest of the wave and catapults it's, it's the whole the, Victorian ideas. The Victorian Christmas in a yeah. nutshell, really. Family, celebrations, charity, yeah. all in one. Place. And a sort of nostalgic element yeah. to it as well, and the, yeah. and the sentimentality of it all. Happy Cheers. Christmas. Yeah. Happy Christmas. To Dickens, Christmas. Christmas was all about feasting and getting together. It's late afternoon, and with the animals tended to, the team settled down for Christmas lunch, joined by friends and neighbours. And a very special guest, landlord Thomas Acton's son, Rupert. Visitor Ooh, has arrived. Mr. Door. Acton ah. Jr., please come through. Hello, Alex. We've prepared you a seat here at the end of the table. Thank you very much. I thought indeed. you wanted to take I've brought you a Christmas card and a small gift. Oh, oh brilliant. Oh, Thank you like very much. I'll give the a card to you. Uh, oh, isn't that lovely? So, what do you think of the free range turkey? Tastes mm. very happy. <laughs> very happy. Happy meat. Definitely. Happy meat. How free range was it? Very, mm. yes, Extremely mostly down the lanes, mm. next door that, fields. Yeah. <laughs> Tiny bit for you. I hope we've authentically recaptured the essence of the Victorian Christmas, the love of the past, the nostalgia, the sentimentality, as well as just bringing all your friends and your family together for a nice big feed up, celebration and wind down. Let's have a Christmas toast. Mm. Cheers, everybody. Yeah. Happy Christmas. Cheers. Happy Christmas. 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 <laughs> Okay. Whoa, 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 sorry. We haven't touched the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> it's a shame not to try it. It really would. Okay. Step up, Peter. Almost looks like a patchy of tongue. It's a bit like pastrami and, and parma mm. ham. What do you think? That's lovely. Yeah. It's just like quite a dry steak. What a fine way to go, eh? Being appreciated by people. We go. Anybody else? Yes, please. I'm glad you're doing this, not me. Christmas pudding is uniquely British and central to the Victorian Christmas feast. <laughs> Way, here we go. Watch out, watch out. Oh, yes. 
Now that Wonderful. is the Christmas pudding. Steaming. <laughs> Fantastic. Pudding. Wow. Can I help somebody do some Christmas pudding? Hillary. In the days before recorded music at the flick of a button, people still found music very important to them and therefore went to quite big effort to have it around them. They would uh, visit music halls and concerts and they would also make their own music at home. God rest you merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Women's magazines always came with songs and sheet music in as part of the, the magazine. Popular music, people making their own music, was a part of our tradition. And in a way, perhaps recorded music has sort of squashed a bit of the music out of us. Comfort and joy, comfort and joy, all tidings of comfort and joy. In making your own entertainment wasn't just limited to music. Unlike the modern British family that would sit down to say something like Zulu or Mary Poppins of a Christmas afternoon, what we're going to do is indulge in a bit of Victorian parlour games. And they were real fans of their parlour games. The game we've opted to play is Shadow Buff. So without further ado, I will call down the first contestant. Can we have the first contestant, please? Peter must guess who is standing behind the sheet. Of course, it's made more difficult by some rather cunning disguises. <laughs> My word. <laughs> OK, here we go, Peter. Raise the bucket. Looks vaguely <laughs> Egyptian. <laughs> Looks vaguely <laughs> Egyptian. <laughs> it could be an obvious one. No, Ruth. There you go, Ruth. Are you going to go with Ruth? Oh. <laughs> I was going to go with Tom. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. This is exciting. I have to admit, this compares really very favourably to sitting down of a Christmas afternoon and watching a movie. <laughs> OK, we have our fifth contestant oh, oh. in place. <gasps> what fearsome beast lies behind the sheet, Peter? Do a little jig for us, <laughs> mystery guest. <laughs> oh. What's your name? Don't tell him, Paul. <laughs> Did you say Paul? <laughs> Paul, I was going to go for Paul, Paul, Paul it is. Oh, it's Andy, isn't it? It is. It's Paul! <laughs> that was uh, a very good game, although I think I lost quite heinously. <laughs> it's terribly hard to tell all these people apart. <laughs> good night. Oh, somebody give me some more gin. <laughs> Next time on Victorian Farm. It's January and the farm needs urgent repairs. Time to call on the blacksmith, the basket maker and the woodsman. Ginger beer required. <laughs> the wheat crop is under attack. Time to master pest control. First one. Victorian style. The reality of life without modern comfort starts to bite. Bathing in a room with no central heating. It's pretty cold. And with spring around the corner, the first baby animals arrive. Oh, absolutely wonderful. Absolutely wonderful.